Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome New York Times best-selling author Earl Swift to the show. He recently released a new book, Across the Airless Wilds, the first major history of NASA's lunar buggy. We're also going to hear about NASA's latest success story as the beloved Hubble Space Telescope is successfully repaired and ready to continue exploring the cosmos. We're also going to journey out together to Venus, looking at the ultimate source of phosphine in the atmosphere of our planetary neighbor. Finally, we learn a possible answer to a 40-year-old mystery about the king of the solar system, Jupiter. The Hubble Space Telescope is now repaired, making for the latest success story from NASA. A voltage regulator controlling a payload computer on board Hubble detected an anomaly on 13th of June, shutting down the orbiting telescope. Engineers switched Hubble over to a backup payload computer, and science instruments turned themselves on over the course of several days. The 30-year-old space telescope should soon return to full operating condition. In September of 2020, researchers announced finding phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus. Now, this gas is mostly produced by biological processes here on Earth, suggesting phosphine seen on Venus might be a sign of primitive life in the upper, upper temperate zones of that hellish planet. A new study, however, finds that this phosphine may in fact be the result of chemical reactions driven by volcanic eruptions on our neighboring world. For four decades, astronomers have witnessed powerful emissions of X-rays and other electromagnetic radiation at the poles of Jupiter. However, the cause of these events remained unanswered. Researchers at University College London recently examined data taken at the same time from Earth orbit and at Jupiter, finding waves in Jupiter's powerful magnetic field likely drive charged particles into the atmosphere of the planet, creating the iridescent displays. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we welcome Earl Swift to the show, talking about NASA's lunar buggy and his new book, Across the Airless Wilds. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to talk with New York Times best-selling author Earl Swift. He has just uh, released a new book called Across the Airless Wilds. It's the first major history 
of NASA's Lunar Roving Vehicle, better known as the Lunar Buggy. Welcome to the show, Earl. Thank you, James. Glad to be here. Yes. Just tell us, uh, what is it that inspired you to write this book? Well, I, I turned 13 years old the day that Apollo 15 landed on the moon in July of 1971. And uh, I have a pretty sharp recollection of that mission, maybe because of that, uh, and of the, the two missions that followed. And I have very, very little recollection of the, uh, of the earlier ones, including Apollo 11, which is the opposite of, of the world at large, I think. Uh, the, uh, the later Apollo missions have dimmed in the, the shadow cast by Apollo 11 by that first that first moon landing. And uh, but I, anyway, as a teenager, I paid attention uh, for the first time, really, to the uh, to the Apollo program, beginning with with 15. And uh, you know, part of that was the fact that I was a teenager and occasionally reading a newspaper. Uh, lived in Houston, so there were, we had moved to Houston uh, recently, and there was that. Um, but mostly it was because of one piece of gear that the astronauts on that mission took with them. And that was a microscopic folding aluminum go-kart. And they took a <laughs> cart of it. And uh, I just thought that was amazingly cool and, and enjoyed uh, the photos that I saw of the rover in action. And you know, it always seemed to be in the background every shot taken on that mission, practically. You know, the, the astronauts were very enamored of it as well. And they took a lot of pictures of their of their ride, and uh, so I, I guess that's uh, that's the origin story for the idea. Uh, and so when my editor at Harper Collins, who's uh, uh, every bit as uh, big a geek as I am, came to me back in the spring of 2019 and said, "You know, I've been thinking it might might be an interesting story to to look into the lunar rover," he needed to say no more than that, and um, yeah, that. That's where it started. Yeah. So do you think that, you know, you're talking about, you know, you're so excited about it because you're a teenager. Do you think that the American love of cars played a role in the development of the rover? You know, that I think that was the supposition at the time. You know, we're the most automotive people on Earth. So, of course, we would take a car to the moon. I mean, it made perfect sense. But no, uh, I don't think so. I think that... Uh, Visionaries who, the visionaries who really kind of uh, uh, foresaw the, the moon missions decades ahead um, recognized right from the start that lunar mobility was going to be an issue. And uh, you need look only as far as the uh, series of stories that Werner von Braun participated in in putting together in Collier's magazine in 1952 to see that. His contributions to that series were a couple of stories that detailed what the first moon mission might look like. And front and center in those stories was what he called a moon car, which looked nothing like the rover we got in Apollo, but, uh, but it did recognize that getting astronauts across the, the broken lunar surface it was, was something that would have to be done by machine. You know, his, his rovers were enormous uh, caterpillar tractor tank-like vehicles with pressurized pressurized cabins uh, in which astronauts would be able to take off their spacesuits and travel in shirt sleeve comfort, and they'd be able to cover hundreds of miles uh, in these things. And of course, the Apollo River was a bit more modest than that, but uh, but it achieved the same the same end. Yeah, and you know, um, just speaking about the earlier designs and thoughts about it, you know, I mean, thoughts of moon cars and have been going around science fiction since before we took to the air. Right? Yeah, that's and, absolutely true. Yeah, and so what role did science fiction play in, in the development of, of this rover? Well, I mean, I, I guess you can make the argument that science fiction is inspiration, you know, uh, for, for what comes later, but um, I'm not sure that it had a heck of a lot of a contribution in, in this case, at least not a direct one. Uh, uh, rovers have started appearing in science fiction as early as 1901, which, as you mentioned, is before the Wright brothers flew and uh, you know, but continued uh, to figure prominently in, in science fiction stories through the 20s, 30s, 40s. 
And Von Braun's piece was really the first nonfiction treatment of a rover, if you can call a futuristic piece like that nonfiction, <laughs> uh, that, that I'm aware of anyway. And uh, it's funny because the this hulking multi-ton behemoth of a moon car that he he envisioned so big in fact that it would require its own rocket to reach the moon right uh, became kind of the, uh, uh, the the basis for nasa's thinking of what a moon car would look like for the next decade uh, hmm. and, and beyond really when you look at the the initial rover studies that were contracted out of the marshall space flight center in the early 1960s they were for what was called a mobile laboratory then, the MOLAB. And this was just just as Von Braun had prognosticated. It was a um, it was on wheels, but otherwise was the same big hulking pressurized sort of vehicle that he had foreseen. And um, it was only because it would require its own Saturn V to get to get to where it was going that uh, that it was eventually eventually put on the back burner uh, as maybe a little bit too much rover for the time right and you, know, you talked about the about the wheels and you know but some of the early designs they actually looked at using tracks like tanks and that would you know seem to be a logical thing yeah. so what were what, what were the advantages how did they choose to go with this six wheel system or you know this wheel system over over well, tracks. I, I guess uh, you can credit one guy in particular, and that was a, a, a Polish uh, immigrant named M.G. Greg Becker, who uh, who came to the United States to work for the uh, Detroit Arsenal as a mobility specialist. And, and Becker is a guy who should be more of a household name than he is. Uh, he, he invented the engineering discipline of terra mechanics, which is the study of the, the uh, relationship between vehicles and the ground over which they travel. So he studied treads and, and you know, uh, different sorts of wheel surfaces and, and all this to, to marry the right sort of motive device to various forms of, of ground, ranging from loose mud to, you know, to, to sand, to quicksand or whatever. Uh, he started looking into lunar mobility after Sputnik late 50s he got he kind of got the moon bug and he uh, and an engineer who worked for him by the name of Ferenc Pavlik, a Hungarian refugee uh, studied uh, did their initial studies and came to the conclusion pretty quickly that although a tank trade probably offered some slight uh, advantages over a wheel if you had a, a wheel in any comparison uh, a wheel did almost as well and it was infinitely simpler and a heck of a lot lighter. And that the advantages posed by the, or offered by the, the track simply weren't substantial enough to justify the extra weight and complexity. So he, he started advocating uh, going with a pretty conventional vehicle setup with wheels in the, in the very early 1960s, well ahead of most other people. Well, and, you know, as of July 9th, when we're, when we're recording this, uh, across the airless wild is now number two on Amazon's best-selling books about space flight. What is it about the lunar buggy and that really attracts us so? Well, I think that it it's not well. I'm, I'm sure people are interested in the rover. At least I hope they are. But I think it's also that. Uh, it was transformative in what it brought to Apollos 15 through 17. And it's those missions, I think, that have attracted people's uh, attention and, and brought them to the book. Uh, because what the rover did was it remade what was possible to accomplish in three days on the lunar surface. It completely revamped Apollo missions to the moon to the, to the point that uh, when you compare the first three landings with the latter three landings, it's almost as if they were derived from different programs altogether. And, and let me give you an example. Uh, Apollo 11, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land in the Sea of Tranquility. It's a flat, featureless lunar desert, not offering a lot of visual interest, that's for sure. And uh, in their stay on the lunar surface, all of their travels 
would fit inside of a football field with a lot of yardage to spare. The farthest either of them ventured from the lunar module was about 65 yards. And that came at the very end of, of their EVA when Armstrong jogged out to the edge of a crater to get some last minute samples and, and pictures. Uh, fast forward two years to late July, early August of 1971, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin land in the Hadley Apennine region, a, 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 a place without earthly equivalent, really, a, a, an undulating plain surrounded by mountains bigger than the Himalayas. Uh, on one side is a, a gorge a mile wide and a thousand feet deep. And over the course of three days and three EVAs, they traveled more than 17 miles and explored an area, you know, 20 times bigger, 30 times bigger than, uh, than Apollo 11 had. They were able to sample from all of the various landforms around them, which was something that the Apollo astronaut, you know, the 11 astronauts couldn't do. They wound up, because they had the, the rover and the range it offered, uh, they were able to basically uh, do the equivalent of, of several Apollo 11 missions in terms of the science. And the other advantage they enjoyed was that, uh, you know, Armstrong and Irwin, or I'm sorry, Armstrong and, uh, and Aldrin, when we saw them bouncing around on TV as kind of indistinct white blobs, looked like they were having a lot of fun, you know, by right. hop, yeah. wearing the long leg, you know, straight leg lope. But the fact is that they were wearing a spacesuit uh, that was kind of like wearing 20 raincoats, one over the other, and then having that heavy garment pump full of air to the stiffness of an all-season radial. It was hard to move. It was really hard to move. You layer on top of that the fact that you're wearing a, a, a suit that weighs more than you do, most of it in the backpack. Uh, you can't see your own feet from inside your helmet. And then you have the weirdness of moving for the first time in one-sixth gravity, which despite all the training and, and simulations on Earth is something you really can't replicate exactly. Uh, it made simple movement, real work. And that work elevated their metabolic rates, which caused them to burn through the air and the cooling water in their backpacks at an accelerated rate. So they couldn't stay outside as long as they might have. You contrast that with, with Apollo 15. These guys drove wherever they went. That was, that was challenging from a driving standpoint, but it was, it was not physically taxing at all. They'd get out, they do science, uh, you know, they work hard while they were doing that, but then they get back into the rover and they had a cool down built into, into their schedule as they drove to the next science stop. And so they were able to conserve their air and cooling water and stay out, you know, much longer. So the, the rover not only gave them additional range, it vastly expanded the amount of time they had to do the work. And, you know, the... Well, first, I'm just picturing, you know, the lunar vehicle, you know, if it were, you know, done today back in, but, you know, back with that culture, I'm just, you know, imagining it all being decked out like a monkey's mobile. <laughs> <laughs> we showed a great deal of restraint. <laughs> <laughs> Astronauts, you know, with their, you know, Peter Torque wakes on. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, just, you know, one of the things I, I love about your book is the fact that, um, you know, you talk about, you know, you have all these conversations going on in you know, these interviews. You really get inside the head of people um, who are making the decisions. How, how did you, how did you assemble these, these conversations and these thought processes as they happen? Well, uh, a couple of things. I was, I was gratified to learn uh, once I embarked on the project that a great many of the principals who were involved in the conception design and actually driving the rover were still alive and were sharp as a tack and willing to talk to me, eager to talk to me. So there was that. Um, and they were great sources of information and um, very candid about the uh, challenges and problems that they encountered along the way to to putting the rover on the moon, along with the, you know, the ultimate success of the thing. They weren't afraid to, to really talk about how difficult it was because it was difficult. 
But the other thing is that NASA, God love it, never threw away a piece of paper. And all of that paper is waiting for anyone who wants to read it and has the time to read it um, in the National Archives and in uh, special collections at university libraries around the country. So I was, uh, I found most of what I needed at the National Archives in Atlanta. Also found some stuff at the National Archives in Fort Worth. Uh, found Sonny Morea, uh, the, the NASA uh, Marshall Space Flight Center's uh, choice to, to lead the rover program. Uh, found all of his personal papers at the University of Alabama, Huntsville. It's amazing. So, you know, uh, between all of that uh, and a lot of time just uh, bolting vast tracks together and then trying to whittle it down to it, you know, to their essence, um, I, uh, I was able to, to put it together. Assembly is, is the right word, by the way, when you use that. That's exactly what this is. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of left brain just construction to, uh, to the writing process. And um, a lot of it is throwing stuff out. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, final question, you know, back in, you know, back when, you know, the, uh, you know, roving vehicle was being designed, somebody looked at GM's work at the time and said, ooh, Vega, we have to get people, we have to get the people in who designed that in on this project. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I Thank God the Vega wasn't on the market yet. Um, <laughs> came along and just at about the same time the rover did. Um, you know, this is, uh, GM did its space work out of a little defense research lab uh, in Santa Barbara, California. that had really very little connection to Detroit and what Detroit was turning out. I've owned two 1969 General Motors products, both those Oldsmobiles, and uh, I loved those cars. I still remember them very fondly, but would I climb into one of them and drive nearly five miles away from the lunar module and depend on one of those Oldsmobiles to get me back to my <laughs> one way home? Probably not. Um, I think that uh, General Motors had done some of the most impressive advance work in space, you know, in lunar mobility out there. Uh, Becker and Pavlix were kind of the, the two biggest brains you know, in, in that area of, uh, of inquiry. Now, they had a lot of competition from companies like Bendix and Grumman, uh, and even Chrysler got into the game. But, uh, but the General Motors that put the rover together had perfected pieces of the thing in, mm. over the course of the previous decade. So for instance, the rover's signature wire mesh wheels, you know, it had wheels that were, that were made of zinc coated stainless steel piano wire woven into a tight, tight mesh. These things weighed only 12 pounds a piece. And they answered the dilemma of, okay, how do you get a wheel that acts like a pneumatic tire, you know, in shock absorption and traction, but isn't a pneumatic tire because that won't last, you know, more than seconds in the lunar environment. How do you get that? Uh, how, do you, how do you build something like that? And, and Pavlix actually came up with the, the wire mesh wheel. They had developed uh, a way of marrying a fast spinning electric motor that generated very little power. I mean, the motors on, uh, the, the rover had a motor in each wheel hub, but it, each one only generated a quarter horsepower. Hmm. So we're talking, you know, weed whacker territory uh, in terms <laughs> of motor brawn for the whole thing. But they married it to a, a really ingenious little transmission called a harmonic drive that they had been tinkering with for the better part of a decade. So they brought in a, they brought in a lot of experience, a, a lot of trial and error that they had put into various previous uh, iterations of the rover idea, like the MOLAB, uh, and then kind of brought them all together in, in what we got in the, in the finished Apollo rover. And of course, Pavlix, the most important development Pavlix may have done because it, it decided whether or not a rover could go at all was that he figured out how to make the whole thing fold up so that it would fit into a little uh, cargo bay on the on the lunar module and, and you know when you see how the thing folded it's uh, it's diabolically simple and yet complex beyond imagining at the same time so, so real origami 
right, right. And of course, they're doing that now with, for instance, the James Webb Space Telescope, which yeah, is all this magnificent mirror is all folded up to fit inside yeah. an Ariane Five rocket. Yeah, it's uh, it's like watching the old board game Mouse Trap, you know, go exactly. through it, its movements. It's it's, it's impressive and it's fun true. to watch. And uh, speaking of impressive, that was. Uh, Earl Swift, author of Across the Airless Wilds, one fantastic book, just came out July 6th from Custom House. Thanks. Thanks for being on the show, Earl. Love to have you back again anytime. James, thanks so much for having me. Next week, we have a pair of special guests as we learn about vast radio bursts with astronomer and Chime member Caitlin Shin. We're also going to talk with Dr. Stephen Kane, astronomer at the University of California, Riverside. We'll be looking at how private space flights, including the recent flight of Richard Branson to the edge of space, benefit science and our quest for a better world. Please make sure to visit with us then. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early. We depend on support from viewers just like you. Uh, for ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. You can also view every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, <laughs> please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or the Cosmic Companion. Yeah.